Welcome to module 2. In this module, you will be introduced to the different bones present in an animal body with dog as our major reference animal. This module will give you an introductory part explaining the different types of bones and different bone features as well as an in-depth topic focus on the specific parts of a specific bone. To give you an overview, this module is divided into five lecture presentations. Part 1 will discuss the bone classification and different bone features. Part 2 will focus on the anatomy of the skull. Part 3 deals with other actual skeletons like vertebrae, ribs, and bones of the sternum. Part 4 is dedicated for the bones of the thoracic limb, while Part 5 deals with bones of the pelvic limb. At the end of this module, you should be able to identify the different types of bone based on their location, recognize bony features based on their appearances, identify the bones of the actual skeleton, and finally, identify the bones of the appendicular skeleton. The skeletal system provides a supporting framework for the body a firm base to which the muscles of locomotion are attached and protects the softer tissues enclosed within the framework. The skeleton can be considered to be made up of three parts. Actual skeleton forms the central axis of the animal and comprising the skull, the vertebrae, and the ribcage. Appendicular skeleton is composed of the front, and the hind limbs and the limb girdles which attach them to the body. Splanchnic skeleton is found within the soft tissues. In the case of the dog, it is the os penis or the baculum. Specifically, the functions of the skeletal system are for support as it acts as internal scaffold upon which the body is built, locomotion as it provides attachment for muscles which operate a system of levers. It is also responsible for the protection of underlying soft parts of the body and it acts as a storage for essential minerals like calcium and phosphate. Likewise, it is considered as a hematopoietic tissue forming from the bone marrow manufacturers of the blood cells. In total, there are 321 bones present in dogs. The table summarizes the average count per segment of the skeletal system. Note that this is just an average count. The number can vary especially at the vertebral column. Bones can be classified based on their general shape. Long bones are proportionally longer than they are wide. Each has a central marrow cavity and a proximal and distal epiphysis. Example of long bones include the femur and the humerus. Short bones are about as long as they are wide, and each has only one growth center. Examples of short bones are the carpals and tarsals. Flat bones are relatively thin, designed for the protection of organs like brain and for muscle attachment in the case of scapula and pelvis. They have two plates of compact bone with a spongy bone in between. These bones have no marrow cavity but have a small irregular marrow spaces. The flat bones of the cranium consist of outer and inner tables of compact bone and an intermediate uniting spongy bone called diplo. Irregular bones are all the irregularly shaped bones such as the vertebrae and some skull bones. They are primarily for support and ligament attachment. Other minor classification include the pneumatic bone, aberrant long bone, and the sesamoid bone. Pneumatic bones are bones with air spaces in them. This include certain bones of the bird. However, these bones are absent in dogs. 
some literatures considered ribs with a separate classification. Thus, they are classified as aberrant long bones. Sesamoid bones look like sesame seeds. These are bones that are developed in tendons to afford increased leverage. Examples are the patella and the dumbicular bone. Let us now discuss the basic anatomy of a bone. In this case, let us focus on the parts of a long bone. Compact or dense or cortical bone is the hard layer that constitutes the exterior of most bones and forms the entire shaft of long bones. Cancellous or spongy bone is composed of spicules arranged to form a porous network, as you can see here. The spaces are usually filled with marrow. The medullary cavity or the bone marrow cavity is the space surrounded by the cortex of a long bone. In young animals, it is filled with a red marrow or the hematopoietic tissue which gradually is replaced by a yellow marrow or fatty tissue as the animal ages. Epiphysis refers to the either end of a long bone. The end closest to the body is called the proximal epiphysis, while the end farthest from the body is called the distal epiphysis. Diaphysis is the cylindrical shaft of a long bone between the two epiphyses. The diaphysis is also termed as the shaft or the body of the long bone. Metaphysis of a mature bone is the flared area adjacent to the epiphysis. The epiphyseal cartilage or the epiphyseal disc or also known as physis is a layer of hyaline cartilage within the metaphysis of an immature bone that separates the diaphysis from the epiphysis. This is the only area in which the bone can lengthen. Articular cartilage is a thin layer of hyaline cartilage that covers the articular joint surface of a bone. The periosteum is a fibrous membrane that covers the surface of a bone except where articular cartilage is located. Bones have many external features depending on its specific function. It can be a projection or a depression. To define, a projection is any bony feature that protrudes from the major bone part. A depression, in contrast, is a shallow or deep concavity or depressed part of a bone. On the other hand, bony features can also be classified either as an articular or a non-articular structure. If the bony feature provides a functional articulation with other bone, it is considered as articular. If not, then it is non-articular and can be present for other function like muscle attachment. We can combine the mentioned features, thus we can classify bony features into four. It can be an articular projection, non-articular projection, articular depression, or non-articular depression. We will give you examples of each on the following slides. Let's first discuss articular projections. Head is a spherical articular projection. Here is the femoral head, articulating with the acetabulum of the pelvic bone. Condyles, on the other hand, are also articular projection, but unlike the head, they are more cylindrical than spherical as in the case of the occipital condyles of the occipital bone of the skull. Trochlea is a pulley-like articular mass like the distal end of most of the long bones. Facets are those with relatively flat articular surfaces for articulation like in the lumbar vertebrae. For the non-articular projections, we have the following bone features. Process is the general term for any bony projections. 
they can be small or can be large and long as in the case of the zygomatic process of the temporal bone as shown here. Tuberosity is a relatively large non-articular projection. Typical example is the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus which function as the site of insertion of deltoidus muscle. Other non-articular projections include the spine, which is a pointed projection or ridge, as in the case of the scapular spine. Tubercle, as seen on this figure, is a smaller non-articular projection like the greater tubercle and lesser tubercle of humerus. For the articular depression, it can be classified whether they are shallow or deep. Glenoid cavity is a shallow articular concavity as seen at the glenoid cavity of the scapula. On the other hand, if the concavity is deep, the term used is cotyloid as in the case of the acetabulum of the oscoxae as shown here. For the non-articular depression, typical example include the fossa. Fossa is a large non-articular depression. Usually, they are wide in terms of area for the attachment of muscles. Shown here are the supra and the infraspinous fossae of the scapula. On the second figure, we can see a circumscribed hole in a bone. This is termed as foramen. There are many foramina in the body. As shown here is the largest foramen in the skull, which is the foramen magnum. If we connect series of foramina as in the case of the vertebral foramen, they can form a canal thus termed the vertebral canal. For your convenience, here is a summary of the bony features together with their basic description. This is also present at the modules provided. This ends the part 1 lecture of this module. I hope you are now familiar with the basic anatomy of bones and its external features. You may now proceed to part 2 of module 2 which is focused on the anatomy of the skull.